All right. Thank you. So uh, my uh, my name is Ting Yu. I'm a researcher in Qatar Computer and Research Institute. And uh, this is a joint work with my colleagues um, uh, from uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University, uh, Nanyang T uh, Technological University, and uh, Sunny Buffalo. So, um, so this paper first is talk about uh, uh, dependent privacy. It's really there are two models for dependent privacy. The first one is so-called global privacy model. So in this model, uh, each user has their sensitive information, and uh, then uh, this information is collected by uh, some uh, uh, collector. So this collector is uh, trusted somehow so that uh, he sees all the information of each individual. Okay? And um, then you know, we want to learn something from the data. Maybe we want to learn some statistics or build some models. And so in this case, we want to do some uh, privacy preserving data analysis techniques so that we want to guarantee that whatever we learned and published, share with the public, does not help attackers to infer private information of individuals. Okay? So we call it global because now we have party which has the global information of all the uh, uh, of all the users, okay, and uh, another model is called the local privacy model. So in this case, users do not trust any uh, central party to collect their true information. So in this case, before they send their information to a data collector, we need to first apply some uh, um, uh, privacy techniques so that the data we shared with the collector is not really the true data. Okay, and from the shared data, the collector should not be able to infer the private information of individuals. Okay. But hopefully that once we got all this information, by doing some post-processing, we can somehow maybe uh, filter out the noise or you know, uh, get rid of the noise so that we can still learn some models or statistics about the um, whole population. Okay? So this is a local privacy model. And um, this paper also concerned about social networks. Okay? Uh, nowadays, when people talk about social networks, they always um, first think about online social networks, for example, Facebooks, Twitter, uh, linking is such like that. Okay, those are typically a centralized social network in the sense that we have a party which knows everything about this network. For example, for Facebook, you know, if he likes, he can see all the information of individuals, all the intersections, everything. Okay, he has a complete knowledge about this social network. Okay, but we observe here that actually there's a lot of social networks that are actually not centralized, meaning that there's no single entity holds the whole graph. Okay, instead. The graph structure are distributed among individuals, okay? and uh, so in this case, you can now use a global privacy setting to do some competition over the whole graph. Okay? So there's a lot of examples about uh, uh, decentralized social networks. For example, uh, everybody's phone has a contact list. Okay? Conceptually, if you put all the contact lists together of everybody, I got a contact list uh, social network. Okay? But there's no single party holds the contact list of everybody. Okay? So that contact list is distributed among all the users. Okay. Similarly, we're talking about friends, not online friends, but friends we have face-to-face -face, um, communications. So that is also a, a decentralized social network. Okay. I only, only me knows really who I talk to every day. Okay. There's no single party knows that for everybody in the world that who they talk to face-to-face. -to -face. Okay. Sometimes this social network can be very uh, sensitive. For example, if you talk about um, a sexual relationship graph, right? we really hope that there's no single party hold all the information of individual, right? We really want to keep that to ourselves. Okay. So now the question here that if I want to study such decentralized social network, I want to know what kind of properties this central net, uh, this social network has, what kind of like structures um, we have for this kind of uh, social network. How do we do that? Okay. We have to collect information from individuals, okay, but then in this case, we have to protect the privacy of individuals. So this actually forms the, um, uh, the research problem. Hello? Okay. Yeah, this actually gives us a research general problem. So we want to know that can we have some technique to generate a useful synthetic graph based on the decentralized social network we want to study with certain privacy uh, definition and a local privacy model. Okay. So um, here's the outline for the rest of the talk. First, I'm going to talk about the local different privacy. So this is um, a formal privacy model going to use in this work. Uh, then we're going to have a formal definition of problem followed by our approach. Finally, going to show the external results to demonstrate the trade-off between privacy and utility when we're doing this, this kind of uh, 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 synthetic graph generation. All right. So let's first look at local differential privacy. So this is really adaption of the classical differential privacy model uh, to the uh, local privacy setting. Okay. So as we mentioned before, that in this case, for each party, each user, they have their own private information D, and before they send the information D, they need to 
doing some processing of this uh, uh, the, this private information. So this is uh, goes through this perturbation mechanism. Okay. So once uh, the data is perturbed, we send the information to the aggregator, and aggregator going to do some computation and and hopefully uh, compute some output. Okay. And mathematically, uh, we say that a mechanism M satisfies epsilon LDP if for any two input V and V prime. Okay. And the distribution from this mechanism are pretty much the same. So in other words, the difference between the distribution we get from um, input V or input Vm, uh, V prime, is bounded by some parameter e to the epsilon. The epsilon is also called the privacy um, budget. Basically means that the smaller epsilon is, the higher privacy protection we uh, achieve here. Okay. So uh, recently there's a lot of work has been done under this local uh, privacy model. Uh, for example, in the early days, these are used to handle like binary uh, attributes. For example, if you want to have an answer to a sensitive question, you answer yes or no, so we need to do some perturbation to satisfy this property. Okay. And recently we have seen a, a work about other type of data, for example, unary attribute, an attribute of single uh, or a set valued attributes. Okay. Most of the, the work is, um, uh, the computation is about statistics. So for example, I want to see uh, which, what portion of user give me yes answer, which give me no. Okay. Or among a set of values, which is the most popular, uh, say, websites or books or movies among the whole population. Okay. But here, we are dealing graphs. Okay. And we want to generate graphs instead of just statistics. Okay. And uh, when we apply this local different privacy model, um, model to um, uh, graph data, so actually there are two types of LDP we can define. The first one is called node local differ uh, differential privacy. Okay. So in this model, we can search whether one individual is in the is in the graph or not. Okay, so in this case, you know we may change v from a person have connection to everybody to another person which has no connection whatsoever with uh, with anybody in this um, this graph. Okay, and so in this model we can see that a single person may have a dramatic change of the graph. Okay, another uh, less uh, strong model is called edge local defense privacy. So in this case. We don't care to hide whether you're in the network or not. Instead, we only care that I can hide my connection to individuals. In other words, from the published data, from the data I share with the, uh, the server, the server cannot tell whether I have, I'm a friend or a particular guy. Okay? So in this case, I want to hide the inclusion or removal of a single edge. Okay? As we can see here that, in this case, the change of single edge may not change the graph dramatically. Okay? So that's caused less perturbation to the graph. Okay. Of course, both models are useful in different uh, application domains. For Node LDP, is a much stronger model. Okay, and actually, we can see that Node LDP implies Edge LDP. Okay, but in many cases, it's overkill. If you really want to hide, in the extreme case, one individual as a social graph, you have to add a lot of noise, which going to uh, that means that you have to pay a lot of price, a hefty price, in the utility of the data you compute. Okay, and Edge LDP in many cases is also kind of sufficient and appropriate because most of the time we care about our connection or friendship or edge to a certain uh, between pair of nodes. Okay? And so this is uh, the model we adopt in, our, uh, in the rest of this, um, this talk. Okay? Okay. So here's the problem now. Say suppose for each user, it only knows his neighbor list. I only know that I am a friend of this guy, I'm a friend of that guy, etc. like that. I know nothing about uh, the whole graph. Okay? Nobody knows anything about the whole graph. Okay? And uh, hopefully, we want to apply some perturbation mechanism so that we can collect information about user social connections, and we can finally generate a synthetic social graph. Okay? Hopefully, this social graph we generated captures important properties of the original underlying decentralized social graph. Okay. And um, so before I pr uh, present our approach, there are actually two uh, simply intuitive Stroman approaches. Okay? So this focuses on different phase of the uh, the process. So in the first approach, we focus on data collection. Okay, so we know that each user has a, a neighbor list. So I try to get as much as possible about each user's neighbor. Okay, and uh, a second one is focusing on the graph generation process. Okay? because in this whole process, finally I'm going to generate a synthetic graph. Okay, depending on which generation algorithm you use, I may need some parameters. Okay, these parameters are derived from the social network. Okay. So if I can learn these parameters, I can pl plug in these parameters into this algorithm, I can generate a social graph. Okay. So that gives us two strong approaches. So the first one is focusing on the neighbor list. So what do we do here that 
Uh, for each user, we can model its neighbor list as an n-bit uh, vector. Okay, you have one of zeros. One means that I'm a neighbor of a guy, and zero means I'm not a neighbor. I have no edge to that guy. Okay, and then I can adopt this standard uh, randomized technique. Randomized, I can use certain probability to randomly perturb a bit from one to zero or zero to one. Okay, and uh, we can see that if we set p equal to this, then we can have we can guarantee um, uh, epsilon uh, edge differential privacy. Okay, so. Now, once we got the noisy randomized neighbor list, I can just construct graph based on this random uh, this this, uh, this neighbor lists. Okay, so this is pretty simple, straightforward approach. It satisfies um, uh, LDP, but uh, uh, we know that the um, social network is pretty sparse. Okay, the result of this is that once you randomize uh, randomly flip bits, the resulting graph becomes very dense. Okay, actually, for example, even if we set p to be very small, 0 0.01, meaning that only one percent a little bit. Okay, then the graph uh, from this noisy uh, uh, neighbor list will be 200 times more dense than the original graph. Okay, so in other words, we kind of lose information of the original graph. Okay, so what about the second approach? Okay, and uh, so there are a lot of different graph generation algorithms. Some of them only require local information. For example, they only need the node degrees. So this we can do. We call each node know their degrees. Okay, some other algorithms actually require some global information. For example, submetrics of adjacency matrix. And that is pretty hard to collect if you just talk to each individual users. Okay, so suppose we're using an algorithm which only needs node degrees. Okay, then we can do that. We can just ask each user to report their um, degree. Okay, and because we only care about edge uh, differential privacy now, okay, the uh, I don't need to add a lot of noise to uh, distort my degree. So degree distribution can be very sense uh, can be very accurate. Okay, so once I have that, you know I can just use like BTER algorithm. You know, based on degree distribution, I can generate a synthetic graph G. Okay, so the limitation here is that even though by using this approach, I can capture the degree distribution pretty uh, pretty accurately. Okay, so, so that in this case, I can actually compute clustering coefficient of the whole graph uh, accurately. Okay, but I lose a lot of other structural information. Okay, for example, uh, in a BTR, uh, when I do the grouping of uh, users into clusters, it is based on degrees. Okay. So in, in other words, you have two nodes, they have the same degree, then it's very likely they're going to put into the same cluster. Okay, but that's not reflect the real uh, structure of the graph. I may have a lot of users with similar degrees, but they are not uh, socially co connected in the original graph. Okay. So these two approaches give us some observation. So we need to balance between the noise we introduced and the information we want to capture. Okay. In the uh, uh, random uh, neighbor list approach, I try to collect fine grained information. I want to know for each person what are your neighbors. Okay? But because I want to achieve privacy, I have to add a lot of noise there. So whatever I collect here is actually not very useful. We have a, a heavy information loss here. Okay? And for the uh, uh, DGG, basically, basically we just uh, uh, collect the degrees. right? And uh, in this case, I only need to add a small amount of noise. Okay? But the problem here is that what I collect here is a very coarse-grained information. I only know the degrees. and do not know anything about uh, nodes connections. Okay. So that also means that the graph we generated does not capture the structure of the original graph. Actually, we can see that these two approaches represent two extremes in a general framework when we try to um, capture graph structures and to generate uh, synthetic graphs. Okay. So essentially, we can say that uh, we have an approach, we partition all the users into k groups, okay, and then we can ask each user to report uh, their degree to each group. Okay, so in other words, I report k degrees, each for one group. Okay, that's why you can see that if we set k equals to one, this means that I put everybody into a single group, it becomes a DDD approach. Everybody just report their degree. Okay. On the other hand, on the other extreme, if I set k equals to n, all the users, then each user becomes their own cluster, their own group. So what I report here is really just a randomized uh, neighbor list. Okay. So that means that you know, we see that in both extremes, they're not good. So probably we need to find some appropriate partition of nodes to, cheat, uh, to, uh, to achieve a good balance between this uh, noise introduced and the structure we want to capture. Okay. So this is exactly the, 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 the key intuition we want to achieve here. Okay. So what is a good partition of the, um, the nodes? Ideally. You want to cluster nodes who are structurally connected together. For example, we're talking about communities, right? I want to put users who have connection together 
into one cluster. Okay, but that kind of introduced a kind of a, a super dependency, right? To get good grouping, you need to know the structure of the graph, and to know the structure of the graph, you need to get a good um, grouping. So how do we break this uh, circuit dependency? So that means that we cannot only depend on one round information collection from the individual. We have to have iterative process. So at the beginning, I, I cannot do anything. I can only ask users, say, here, a random partition, report your um, degrees to those random partitions. Okay? Then based on user's input, I may have some more idea which users are more close to each other, which are far away from each other. Okay? From this, I can try to refine this grouping. Okay? I can do this through multiple rounds. Finally, I can get, hopefully, I can get a good cluster. Okay? So this is really the, the basic idea we have here. So in this framework, we have uh, like a three-phase approach. In the first phase, the uh, curator or the data collector just randomly partition users, okay? because at this stage, I have no information about uh, uh, structures. Okay? And uh, once the user receives this random partition, each user is going to report the degrees to each partition. Okay? And uh, based on that, I should be able to figure out or infer that which nodes are closer to each other, which are not. Okay? And so based on that, I have a better way to partition the, uh, partition the user. Okay? And I can send this newly, new partition scheme back to the user for them to report again. Okay? We can imagine that the more we're doing this, hopefully we can refine this process. Okay? But as we, we have to emphasize here that every time we do this iteration, we're going to consume some privacy budget because we want to make sure that every time you report something, it satisfies uh, edge defender privacy. Okay, you cannot just do it forever because very quickly, you know, you're going to use up your privacy budget. Okay, so in our approach, we just have two rounds of refinement. Okay, after that, we got good uh, clusters. We're going to use some um, graph generation algorithm to generate edges between those clusters and inside these clusters to have a synthetic graph. So this is um. um really the key idea here. So I'm not going to report, uh, repeat the process here. I just want to use some example to show how it works. So at the beginning, we have this graph on the left. Okay, we can see that visually there are three clusters. Okay, and, uh, but at the beginning, you know, I don't know anything about the graph. So I just do a random partition. For example, I say I partition this whole users uh, into uh, two partitions, okay, two groups. Okay. I can see that in this case it's random. So uh, pretty much I just pick half and half from each cluster. So they are really not uh, structurally cl close to each other. Okay? And uh, after that, I'm going to get users' uh, degree count to each partition. Okay? And uh, so then based on some optimization uh, heuristics, which we, we list at least the uh, formula here, but I'm not going to talk about it, we have a, we have a better estimation what should be the number optimal number of um, uh, partitions. So in this case, after this uh, report, I do the reasoning, I feel that, okay, now I actually need three clusters rather than two clusters, okay? And now I need to report new three partition of the nodes, okay? Not only I know that I need three, also based on the first round report, I can know that maybe the, these several nodes should be together and some others should be uh, in another group, okay? So I keep doing this, so I'm gonna send this new clustering, uh, cluster back, I got a new report, I can do a further round of refinement. So I got this, uh, um, uh, this new cluster as we show in the uh, right side. Okay. So once I have that, I stop here. I'm going to generate uh, intra edge, intra cluster, and inter, uh, inter cluster edges based on some uh, uh, graph generation algorithms. Okay. So we can see that the final graph we obtained here is, is not, not exactly the same as the underlying social network but hopefully we capture most of the structures. Okay, so that's our algorithm. Okay, there are some details about analysis, how to derive this case, such like that. I'm not gonna talk about it here. So we run experiments to see how well this synthetic graph captured the, um, the property of the real graph. Okay, we, we have a, a benchmark data from Facebook, Enron, Last.fm, and another um, social network. Okay, so here for utility, we measure several uh, different aspects. The first one is see that we see that how well our algorithm can capture the global statistics of the graph. For example, modularity and clustering coefficient. Okay? And the second one, we see that how well it preserves the st structure of the, um, the graph. So here we, are doing, uh, we apply the same community discovery algorithm. Okay? Then we compare the communities we discovered from the true, uh, true graph versus the uh, communities we discovered from the synthetic graph to see how similar they are. Okay? And in the third uh, aspect, we see that suppose we do some application on top of this synthetic graph. Okay, how you how how much 
uh, how, how much utility I can get out of this uh, social graph. So for this purpose, we're using social recommendation. So social, social recommendation means that, you know, based on uh, how my what, what my neighbors um, purchased, so I can, you know, recommend some top K items uh, uh, for, uh, for a user, okay. All right, so, um, uh, uh, so you have time, right? Okay, so, so this one is about the graph structure statistics, right? For, for example, we can see that for modularity, you know, the, uh, this is a relative error. This means the lower the better. Okay, we can see that our algorithm, which is a green one, you know, uh, it's really um, uh, much better than the two naive approaches. Okay, there's a big margin there, okay? And uh, for the clustering coefficient, it's interesting that actually our algorithm is not as good as the, um, uh, the, the, the DGG algorithm, which only relies on the degree. Okay, this is understandable because this uh, um, uh, DGG algorithm is really optimized to capture clustering coefficient. Because basically it's just based on degrees, then you can, get, you can compute clustering coefficient. Okay? But what we see here that what we report is not far away from the uh, DGG algorithm. Okay. Okay. And uh, next way we use this AMI parameter, uh, AMI matrix to capture the similarity between um, um, uh, communities discovered. Okay? So here, the higher the better. As we can see that you know, our approach really uh, do a much better job than the, the two naive approaches. You know, there's a, a significant margin regarding what we can discover of the uh, uh, communities in the real graph, and um, you know, which is much uh, much accurate, much more accurate than the what we can discover using these two naive approaches. Okay. Similarly, when we use our graph, synthetic graph, to do a social recommendation, again, there's a there's a uh, significant advantage what we can offer compare the two approaches. And this is validated through two different uh, data sets. Okay. Okay. So uh, as, a conclusion, uh, um, as a conclusion, this is the first effort toward uh, process preserving graph analysis over decentralized social network under the local uh, uh, differential uh, privacy model. Okay. And uh, so here, each user has only limited view of the so, uh, whole graph. Okay. So it becomes a very challenging problem. How can we collect information from individuals and to uh, re can generate a synthetic graph to capture the useful structures of the uh, original underlying uh, social network. Okay, and uh, the key observation here that we have to do a multi-phase information class, uh, uh, collection so that we can gradually refine the clusters we get from the uh, 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 from the user, and hopefully by using this cluster later we can capture the um, the, the original uh, graph. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, actually following up work we can do here. For example. You know, in some situations, really need to note different privacy, which is very challenging. You know, even in underlying the um, global uh, privacy model, to achieve no different privacy is not easy task. Okay, and there's also a lot of other uh, graph mining techniques, uh, uh, we, uh, graph mining tasks we want to do. For example, if we if we want to do a frequent subgraph mining, okay. So in this case, how do we do that? You know, we uh, under this uh, local different privacy model, uh, we don't know yet. Okay. All right, thank you. In the results, I missed the part. What what's the comparison compared to real value? If you don't have any differential privacy, if you have the or, an original one, uh, so which one? So they're talking about the, for example, community discovery. Yeah, for, so you are comparing your method against two baselines. I was right. curious about if you send everything with no privacy. Right. What was the result look like? Oh, How so much? so for example, here this is community discovery, right? So when we first run this uh, uh, community discovery algorithm over the true graph, uh -huh. we got communities. Okay, then we run this uh, uh, same algorithm over the synthetic graph. We also get a bunch of communities, right? Mm -hmm. We just compare that how different those communities are. A difference measure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So basically here, the, the better, the, the higher means that the more common communities we discovered. Okay, what about the previous one? The previous one is the uh, clustering coefficient and the modularity of the graph. So this is relative error. Again, relative, relative distance? Relative to the true modularity and clustering coefficient of the original graph. Uh, one final thing, uh, how many rounds did it require? What was the round? We only took two rounds, actually. Two rounds. Because every round we do more, if we have more rounds, we're going to inject more noise into the, uh, each round. So, it's, so that doesn't mean the more the better.
I have a related question, which is uh, how does the locally differentially private approach that you present here compare to centralized differential privacy? Uh, I imagine you could have another line on your chart that you could compare how much you're losing by doing that. I see, I see. Yeah, we actually, we did have a, a, a previous work talking about how generous synthetic graph uh, in the lo uh, global privacy model. But uh, yeah, we, we didn't compare that. We definitely need to do that. Thank you. Uh, if, uh, so would you agree that uh, this method is a, can be classified as a spectral method because uh, in the first round, you effectively requ uh, recover uh, kind of spectral properties of, uh, uh, of the nodes in the graph? Uh, it's kind of a sketching for... Uh, yes, uh, yes. So basically, we, we the cluster we find in the final stage really just say that those nodes are likely to be together, okay? even though there's no guarantee about that. Actually, we cannot guarantee that. Okay? No. But then based on that, we stop here, then we just follow some uh, uh, standard model to generate edges, okay? So, so yeah, in some sense, it's kind of sketched there. Sorry, one last question. We, we have lots of, lots of time, so I'm gonna take it. Sure. Um, do, you have, do you have any, uh, for sort of following up on that, do you have any theoretical uh, analysis about how far off your approach can get? Um, I hope we can, but it's really hard. Uh -huh. okay, because this is not like statistics, right? I can do some theoretical analysis of that. Because actually, for example, even for um, uh, modularity or classing coefficient, uh, it's really hard to form a, a mathematical way to describe what are the errors which we need to do. It also depends on the structure of the graph. Okay? So uh, I think that's kind of an uh, interesting problem because a lot of research on different prophecies that you can do, you can do analysis, say, I, my, my algorithm satisfies different prophecy. That we can do analysis formally. But in terms of utility, it really depends on the application. And once the application is pretty complicated, uh, it's very hard to do the uh, theoretical um, uh, analysis or bound or something like that. Okay, so this concludes the session. Thank you. All right, thank you.